Well, hello and welcome to lecture 2-1. So this lecture is going to cover uh, cytology and a little bit of embryology. 2-1 um, also includes uh, some information about the spinal cord, the spinal cord tracts and nuclei, uh, which we'll talk about in more depth in a later uh, video. So to start off with, uh, here we have uh, the cytology and embryology section. And this first slide is actually uh, showing the cover to Micrographia, which is Robert Hooke's initial uh, book, uh, scientific article, on his invention of the microscope and what he saw with it. So he published this in 1665, and you can see the middle image is a drawing that he made of the microscope itself. Of course, now we have much better microscopes uh, not not candle powered, but uh, illuminated by LEDs, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And when he looked under through this microscope at a leaf, this image on the right is the first he saw, and he noted the uh, cellular appearance uh, looked like little compartmentalized portions uh, within the microscopic view of the leaf. So that's where we get the terminology of the cells. Uh, that we see within the body. And so, of course, each cell uh, is, has its uh, different various components, as we now know. Uh, so this is sort of bio 101 type information, the different organelles of the cell. So I provide this just to make sure that you all are on the same page and, and recall that information. Of course, a cell has a, um, a membrane a uh, composed of a uh, phospholipid bilayer. Within this membrane are going to be different types of proteins and cholesterols that determine the permeability of the membrane and the functionality of the cell as it interacts with its external world. So there are uh, integral proteins that span both bilayers of the phospholipid membrane. Uh, and so those can convey a signal from the outside to the inside. Uh, such as an ion channel or a, uh, uh, different types of channels, as you see here on the left, can actually uh, convey different substances. Glucose transporters are another example of a channel protein. And then, of course, there are uh, integral proteins like the uh, integrins uh, and the tight junction proteins, which physically link one cell to another. And that allows these cells to communicate with each other uh, through mechanical physical forces as well. Uh, we can see that there are peripheral proteins either on the external or internal surface of the cell and these peripheral proteins are part of the messaging uh, functionality of the cell. So uh, perhaps a protein that um, detects uh, something on the external surface like a receptor uh, can signal to a peripheral protein to cause some conformational change in a surface protein that then dissociates, goes down into the cell, and causes some sort of metabolic uh, enzymatic reaction. <clears throat> of course, in our bodies, there are many different types of cells, uh, a huge uh, variety of cells, but we classify those into four main types of cells, connective tissues, uh, epithelial cells, uh, muscle tissue, and neuronal cells. And so these different broad classifications of cells um, uh, you know, allow us to understand the different functionality uh, and the different uh, components of the organs of the body. So the question uh, from a cytological and embryological standpoint, from a developmental standpoint, is how do we go from one uh, cell at fertilization to all of these different types of cells uh, later on in the developing and adult form of the body? And so the answer is cell diversification. <clears throat> so another way to state that is uh, if life starts as a single cell, how do we develop into multicellular organisms? Or uh, how can one cell divide and become different daughter cells? Uh, another more scientific way to state that is how do diverse phenotypes 
develop from a single genotype. So every cell in our body has the same DNA. Uh, so how does one cell, how does it get programmed to express different proteins and turn into a different uh, functioning type of cell in the body? So there's two different uh, types of uh, division that cells can undergo that, uh, that allow us to describe how diversification occurs. The first of these is asymmetric cell division. Uh, I have the word fate here in quotation marks because um, in this way, the cell is uh, predetermined at its uh, initial state to divide asymmetrically, to divide into different halves. Uh, so there's no signaling that occurs on that cell after it has formed to, to cause that asymmetry. It's just at the cell's initial state, it will divide asymmetrically. Symmetric cell division, on the other hand, uh, a cell is programmed to divide symmetrically and form the same two daughter cells, and then external signals can induce differentiation after that division or during that division process, potentially. So here are some diagrams to describe that asymmetric cell division. We can see that during the division process, uh, some signaling molecule or intracellular components are going to travel uh, to one portion of the cell so that when that cell divides, the daughter cells have a different concentration, a different proportion of that uh, molecule or protein or, or whatever the case may be. And so this process is due to that internal signaling uh, that uh, was initiated at the birth of the original mother cell. Uh, so it's that internal sorting process that determines that fate. And so here are some uh, actual microscopic images using fluorescent dyes uh, that show you that sorting process that's occurring. Symmetric cell division uh, does not have that initial sorting process. The two daughter cells are identical at first and then external signals uh, interact with that cell, causing it to uh, express different proteins and follow down a different path, which leads to a different identity of the third generation cells. So there's different processes through which this can happen. One is uh, called lateral inhibition. So a cell is not just floating freely in space. It's very tightly packed in most cases, uh, with other cells expressing surface proteins, integral proteins, and those cells are competing in a way uh, for expression patterns. Uh, so uh, if one nearby cell is signaling to all of its partner cells that it has already proceeded down a path toward a certain type of uh, uh, cell uh, tissue or tissue type, then it will signal to the other nearby cells don't worry guys, I've got this. You can go down a different path than I'm going down because I've got that one path covered. So that's called lateral inhibition. And you can see an example of that here. We have a generally homogeneous collection of cells here. And by chance, um, maybe one cell is dividing slightly faster or growing slightly faster because of temperature fluctuations or energy production, availability of glucose, whatever. One cell starts going down a specific path, so it gets a predominance of a certain protein type, and it's signaling to all of the other cells nearby it um, that it has achieved that differentiated state. And so the result is that all the nearby cells start going down a separate path and that one cell can go down its designated path. Uh, another type of symmetric cell division uh, that we can talk about is inductive interactions. So this is basically the opposite of lateral inhibition. Here we have cells in a specific region, an inductive region, sending out uh, growth factors, signaling molecules to the other nearby cells saying, I am this type of cell, 
uh, and uh, everyone next to me should differentiate into a related type of cell so we can expand this region and uh, become uh, predominant in this area. <clears throat> So here I'm describing some examples of how that inductive differentiation can happen. Uh, short range cell to cell interactions, physical interactions can cause that as well as long range signals uh, such as growth factors. These long range signals are um, more, in a more general term as morphogens because they cause a morphogenic change in the nearby cells or cells uh, to, out to a certain distance. And the concentration of those morphogens in a region uh, is going to uh, determine the ability of the cell that's receiving, that's sensing those morphogens, to differentiate. So a cell has to get a certain amount of morphogens in order to fully differentiate into that next form. If it doesn't reach that cutoff point, that limit, then it won't differentiate into that type. So for that reason, the concentration gradient of the inducers of these morphogens is critical to determining uh, the morphogenic uh, potential of nearby cells. And this gets even more complex when we think about uh, morphogens that may be activators and morphogens that may be inhibitors. So there are a multitude of different concentration gradients that might occur resulting in uh, a gradient of morphogenic activity. So that gradient of morphogenic activity means cells closer to uh, the source are going to differentiate and cells closer to the inhibitory source will not differentiate. And so this process occurs uh, throughout development. Here I'm showing you example of limb development uh, where we see a polarizing region so there's a cell here that grows to become a collection of, of cells that cause a anterior posterior gradient uh, in the limb bud. That limb bud, that gradient then determines which side of our hand is the ulnar and the radial side. So these processes are critical uh, and they're set forth very early on in development to form these gradients. So very early on, in fact, that it happens, uh, uh, it's, it's, it has contributions at the very earliest stage during, uh, during fertilization. So just a note here, this is not a, an embryology course. I am never going to ask you what happened on day one or day eight or what happens during week three. I show you embryology information only to reinforce the structure that you learn in the adult uh, case. So uh, while the embryology is important, I don't care what happened on what day um, or what fine grain sequences are occurring. Uh, so again, just to drive home this point about development and cell differentiation, during fertilization, the uh, spermatozoa uh, will fertilize the egg at a certain point. That fertilization of the egg at that certain point develops a polarity in the, uh, in the oocyte, in the blastocyst. And that polarity uh, will create a pole, an axis, a, a vegetal pole, and an animal pole is what they're called. <clears throat> and so we can see that here in a um, very high um, magnification microscopic image where the embryoblast is forming on the animal pole of the blastocyst. <clears throat> so as, this, uh, as the fertilization occurs, of course, we have cell division rapidly occurring, uh, resulting in implantation uh, you know, by early week two. Uh, and during that process, that pole forms <clears throat> and becomes accentuated. So during week two, we have uh, an animal pole that's featuring epidermal cells. <clears throat> 
and we have a vegetal pole forming a yolk sac with the uh, um, endodermal cells. During week three, a process called gastrulation occurs. During gastrulation, uh, we have the structural formations that occur within the embryoblast, and, and this is the result of these signaling molecules, these induction uh, morphogens. And at the core of the epiblast, which will become the, uh, the, um, the uh, epidermal cells, we have differentiation into mesodermal cells. <clears throat> the hypoblast uh, below will become uh, infiltrated by those uh, mesodermal cells to end up forming the, endo, uh, the endothelial cells, the endoblast. <clears throat> so after that process takes place, uh, the embryoblast develops a structure from this mesodermal connective tissue condensing in the core. And that mesodermal condensation uh, forms what's called the notochord. The notochord is going to be the uh, signaling source for a process called neurulation, which occurs in week three. So that notochord is going to send out inducing signals to the, uh, the epiblastic layer uh, to make those uh, epithelial cells differentiate into neural tissue. So that's where we get the, uh, the fourth tissue type. So the mesoderm is going to become connective tissue and muscle, uh, and the um, epiderm is going to become skin as well as uh, the neural tissue. We can see that neural tissue forming at this groove just above the notochord. <clears throat> that neural groove is going to enclose and become uh, the presumptive spinal cord of the embryo. On either side of the uh, presumptive spinal cord, the neural tube is what it's called. On either side of the neural tube, we have mesodermal structures called the somites. So uh, take a moment to imagine if uh, the neural tube is going to become the spinal cord. What surrounds the spinal cord in the adult? What type of tissue? Is it muscle? Is it uh, connective tissue? Is it bone? And uh, so in this case, it's actually bone. These somites end up forming the different vertebral segments all up and down the embryo. So these somites end up becoming the vertebrae, they'll also send off cells to inhabit the limbs, uh, to form those limb buds to develop the muscle and bone of the limbs, which we'll see later on. <clears throat> so here's a different drawing of that neurulation process. No difference here, except now we have actual electron micrographs uh, from an electron microscope showing uh, the different stages of neurulation that occurs in the third week. So of course, uh, now we're thinking clinically, so what are some defects that can occur uh, during this process of neurulation? Well, here I'm showing you two examples of a, what are called neural tube closure defects. Uh, so, uh, that process of closing the neural groove to become the neural tube uh, can go awry. And of course, uh, this can, depending on the location in the axis of the embryo, this can result in various different defects, but they all have basically the same uh, origin in developmental terms. So here on the left, we have a condition called craniorachiskesis, where the brain is actually formed out of the back of the head. The back of the skull has not closed around that neural tube uh, before the brain began to form. So the brain has actually formed outside the head. And <clears throat> here we have spina bifida, 
where the uh, neural tube did not close uh, lower in the uh, individual. And so the spinal cord is formed outside of the vertebral canal. Just a little note with this slide, it looks complicated, but there's just one main concept that I want to tell you about is that uh, we see here a tree showing the differentiation of all of the different types of tissue in the human body, in the mammalian body. Uh, and we can see where these branch off during that developmental process. But the thing I want you to note here isn't necessarily um, all of the details, uh, which are important to know. There will be questions uh, such as, what's the embryological origin of this structure? But what I want you to notice is that many of these tissues have multiple developmental origins. And as the course goes on, we'll describe those, um, those special cases. We'll talk about why they occur. And those special cases are important from a clinical diagnostic perspective. So for instance, I have highlighted bone here. And bone can form from the mesodermal layer but it can also form from neural crest cells from the uh, neural tissue. And so different bones in, in different locations in the body, uh, particularly of the face and head, those bones actually form from the presumptive neural tissue uh, that expands outward from the neural tube and travels uh, to different regions of the body. <clears throat> So we've talked about uh, basic development. Uh, we've talked about these uh, signal inducers. Now let's talk about how these axes form and some specific um, morphogens that cause these differences in axis formation. So uh, we're sticking with the neural tube here. And of course, from undergraduate anatomy, I'm sure you realize that the spinal cord has a, um, an anterior and a posterior uh, portion or a uh, dorsal and a uh, ventral portion. And the dorsal portion of the spinal cord uh, is composed mainly of sensory neurons, whereas the ventral or anterior portion is composed mainly of motor neurons. So this dorsal ventral axis formation is uh, partly the result of the notochord and its uh, signaling processes, as well as the roof plate and floor plate of the neural tube itself. So the notochord releases a morphogen uh, referred to as SHH, uh, named after Sonic Hedgehog. And it's named Sonic Hedgehog because a graduate student about 20 years ago, I, or 30 years ago, identified it in a laboratory. Uh, and of course, the person who discovers something gets to name it. The graduate student apparently really loves Sonic Hedgehog. So now we have a morphogen named after Sonic the Hedgehog. Uh, so the roof plate, on the other hand, releases BMP, bone morphogenic protein, so named because it was first identified in relation to um, bone morphogenesis. But it also has a role in uh, the neural tube formation. So BMP in the roof plate, uh, uh, released by the roof plate, causes the differentiation of neurons in the alar plate, in the dorsal portion, to become sensory neurons. Uh, SHH uh, from the notochord and the floor plate are released and cause the basal plate to differentiate into uh, motor neurons. So that's how that dorsal ventral axis occurs. And so we'll see um, that, of course, this is not so simple a thing. There's uh, individual nuclei within the uh, dorsal horn and the ventral horn of the spinal cord, which we'll talk more about uh, in the next lecture. So after those neurons are formed and begin to differentiate from these morphogens, they have to travel to the different nuclei in which they'll reside. And they have to send out processes to connect to uh, the different regions, uh, the different structures that they're going to uh, activate or um, you know what have you. Uh, 
And so this process occurs uh, through the uh, transportation of these cells along radial glia. So here uh, we're taking a blown up view of a small region of the spinal cord and we can see that there are radial glia, their cell bodies along the central portion of the spinal cord. And they uh, have projections that extend out throughout the spinal cord. And those projections uh, are the pathways, like the railroad tracks, for these sensory and motor neurons to travel. When they get to a certain point uh, as they're traveling, these neurons, uh, the concentration gradient of their environment changes in regard to these morphogens, and that's their signal to stop. Or they start detecting a high enough concentration of inhibitory morphogens or growth signals, and that's their signal to stop. Uh, and that's how we form the different individual nuclei within the spinal cord and the central nervous system is these concentration gradients. So I'll also note that uh, SHH and BMP are used not just in the spinal cord, but in a number of different locations in the body. So this is an example of biology conserving changes and using uh, signals and, and things for multiple different purposes. So it, it manages to do this because the cells that it's targeting have different responses to these signaling molecules. <clears throat> so at this point, the different nuclear regions of the horns of the spinal cord are forming, and then the axons, uh, for instance, of the motor neurons have to extend out to the muscle that they innervate. So these axons are extending into the limb buds attracted by the uh, mesenchymal stem cells, the mesodermal cells within the limb buds. Uh, and that causes the attraction of that axon. When it reaches the muscle uh, that it, um, when, when I'll, I'll say it in a more passive way, when the axon gets close enough to the um, morphogenic signal, the growth factor, that it begins to innervate that structure, then that's the cue that that neuron is going to, um, for instance, cause contraction of that muscle. There's no pre-programmed connection that forms. This neuron isn't destined to innervate a particular muscle. What happens is that these axons are just following these signal gradients throughout the limb buds until they happen to get close enough to the source of that morphogen. And then that's what they innervate. That's what they attach to and begin to innervate. And so there's a competition again uh, between neighboring cells so that we don't get dual innervation. And in fact, uh, dual innervation does happen to occur during development. But as our bodies grow and um, we learn to walk and we learn to coordinate our motor activity, then the neurons that um, don't facilitate the intended action, those get paired off. They actually die off through apoptosis. So that uh, concludes the uh, portion of this lecture on uh, cytology and embryology. Next, we'll get into the different regions, the different nuclei of the spinal cord and see what functionality they have.